Welcome to the Andy Toole Coaches Show with Robert Morris, basketball head coach, Andy Toole. Well, the Colonials are on a five-game win streak right now. It felt pretty good here at the Sewell Center the other night, knocking off Bryant and Central Connecticut State in consecutive games. Coach Toole, these Colonials are doing the right things at the right time. Of course, right now you're in the stretch run. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's so much emphasis on this part of the season, late February, early March. It's when you want to be playing your best basketball, and I think we've We've made some good strides. We've, we've done some really good things in the, in the five game winning streak. Uh, I think we've gotten back a little bit to our focus of defending better than we had. And hopefully we can continue to do those things and, and tighten up some areas where, you know, we still need improvement and, and continue to improve as we go into this, you know, most important part of the season. A couple of good things about those uh, two home wins, of course, that 40 point mark uh, that you held Bryant to. I know how much you emphasize defense and that is an emphasis on defense. It was, and I think a lot of it was a product of our ball pressure. You know, I think there was a stretch maybe midway through January where we, we weren't making people uncomfortable. We weren't trying to speed them up anymore. And I think we've gone back to really trying to put some pressure on the basketball, make people a little bit uncomfortable. And I think when you do that, what happens is people are less likely to make good decisions. And sometimes they're less likely to make, you know, tough shots. So uh, I thought we did a very good job again of that against Bryant. And I thought we did a good job of it as well on Saturday against Central. Yeah, speaking of Central Connecticut State, that was, uh, a darn good victory, 68-60, to 60. considering Central uh, did not treat you well when we were in New Britain a couple of months back. Well, actually just about a month back. It was not a pretty game up there for Robert Morris. No, they definitely uh, played very, very well when we were up at their place, and they were the ones who set the tone in terms of energy and effort. And, you know, we were on our heels the majority of that game, and so I was glad we had talked to the guys about this being a, a, a real benchmark kind of for how much we've improved since then. Had we made strides? Had we clean things up that were issues for us early in the conference season and I thought guys came out and responded very very well I thought that you know we continued to play unselfishly on offense which is a key for us and then also I thought our defensive energy and effort were, were where it needed to be against a team that has three guys that can go and get 20 plus on any given night that that's for sure I'll tell you another thing about uh, those uh, two wins over Bryant and Central Connecticut State the Bryant victory 69 to 40 Central Connecticut State Robert Morris topped them 68 to 60 in those wins you started getting contributions from other people who need to step up their games we'll talk about those other guys in a little bit but right now let's take a look at the overall scheme of things 20 wins again you hit the plateau four of the last five seasons have brought Robert Morris 20 victories, 112 wins since the 07-08 campaign. This program is really off and running. Yeah, hopefully we can kind of add a couple more wins to that total uh, as we finish out this season. But you know, being able to win 20 games and, and uh, do it four out of five seasons, I think, is a pretty strong accomplishment for a program. You know, that's at the mid-major level. You know, you you play you know a very difficult non-conference schedule. The Northeast Conference, as we've always talked about, is is improving year by year. This is only the second time in league history that there's three Northeast Conference teams with 20 wins, us, LIU, and Wagner. Uh, and so you see that the teams are getting better. People are, are preparing their teams, and coaching staffs are out hungry recruiting and, and finding better talent for the Northeast Conference. And so to have done it four out of five years is just you know, a credit to the guys in this locker room, all the effort that they put in, uh, and the guys that you know were here the year before and the year before and the year before. So. Uh, it's nice to get back to that 20-win plateau, and it's nice to, uh, like I said, hopefully add some more on as the season continues. You know, we talk about the conference season all the time, but even the non-conference season, if we can go back to the first few weeks of the campaign, we're talking about three wins against Atlantic 10 teams. That was something that uh, maybe no one believed in at Robert Morris uh, some years ago, five, six, seven years ago. Yeah, I mean, I think there, there's times where, you know, the, the, the matchups have to work out for you, and there's different circumstances that, that you know, help you win and lose games, but... Um, I think we've created a culture here that regardless of who our opponent is, if we go out and do the things that we're supposed to, we'll give ourselves a chance. And I think you saw that play itself out against LaSalle and against Duquesne. You know, those weren't home games. One was a neutral site game, one was on the road, going on the road to James Madison. You know, doing some things like that where you go into those games not looking and saying, oh, this is, you know, a, a team from the Atlantic 10, we have no chance. It's let's go out and play the way we're supposed to. Let's go out and play together. Let's go out and defend. And we'll see what happens down the stretch. And I think in you know, the Duquesne as well as the LaSalle game, I thought that you know, our guys followed our formula very, very well. They played with great energy and effort. And you wouldn't be able to tell who was you know, from a supposed higher league and who wasn't. And of course, looking at the total scheme of things, the cosmic scheme, if you will, 
Dating back to 1976, this program has been Division I. Before that, it was a JUCO, and it was the first JUCO program in the history of college basketball ever to go from the junior college level all the way into Division I. Since 1976, uh, a lot of games have been played, 500 victories now, and you were the coach who got the 500. Yeah, it's nice to have your name next to it. Um, you know, unfortunately, you probably didn't do as much work for it as a lot of other people have. You know, there's so many good players, so many great coaches that were here before I was or before any of these guys were in this locker room or long before this locker room even looked like this. Uh, and I think that all the, you know, gradual increases in, in the profile of the program, um, in the way the program is, is just run on a day-to-day -day basis, and to get to the 500th win is a tribute to all those people that were here before. And last year was funny, we had a bunch of alums come in the locker room and they said it didn't look quite like this when they were here. Um, but it was through a lot of their hard work and a lot of their efforts that it does look like this now. And um, you know, hopefully for the people that come 10, 15 years down the line from this group, you know, things will be you know, even better for, for those. Let's talk about this group. Elijah Thompson has really come on strong here as of late. Elijah has uh, been coming in off the bench as a matter of fact, he missed a couple of games, and all of a sudden he's come in and contributed well. He's averaging 14 points, four and a half rebounds. He was eight of eight from the free throw line in one of the home games uh, just this past week, and uh, he has really given you the spark that you've been looking for out of him. Yeah, I think, and what he's done mostly is he's simplified his game. You know, he hasn't gotten incredible extra number of touches or an extra number of shots. I just think he's been so much more efficient in his game. And, in terms of catching the ball with his back to the basket or catching the ball in a drop-off situation and being prepared to go and finish it and taking it to the rim strong so you do go to the free throw line, you do end up getting you know eight free throws in a game because you're attacking the rim. You know, not wasting time dribbling, not wasting time doing things that allow the defense to catch up. Once he has them at a disadvantage, he's really been able to just elevate and score the basketball and that's what we've been trying to get him to do all year and I think it, it comes from you know, an anticipation that the next pass might be coming to me, or if it does come to me, what, I'm, what am I going to do with it? And I think in the last two games, he's, he's been terrific with that, and we've talked all year long that if he can continue to play at the level that he's played over the last few games, it makes us just such a much more dangerous team because now with him and with Mike and with Lawrence, you know, operating around the rim, and with guys like Belton and, and Karan Williams and Russell Johnson operating on the perimeter, now all of a sudden you have you know, a real balance to your offense, and that's always difficult to guard when you have the ability to score in multiple areas. You mentioned the guys in the paint, but the, the team is just playing better inside the lane, inside the paint right now, too. Absolutely, and I, like I said, I think it's been a focus of all year long we've been working to get them the basketball. I think our guards have made good decisions about when to get it to them and where to get it to them so that they're able to be successful when they do get it. And now once they've been able to kind of elevate and go score, it's just allowed our guys, it's given our guards even more confidence to, to send the ball back down there again. And I think it's, it's both sides, the perimeter guys and the post guys working together uh, to kind of allow each other to have success. And I think it's allowed offensively for us as an entire team to have success. The other night, Belton Jones almost got knocked loopy in the game. As a matter of fact, I think he was kind of staggered on his feet. He came to the sideline. I know that uh, Jason Daly, your superb trainer, and uh, Dr. Tanya Hagen took a look at him. All of a sudden, I'm thinking, he's not coming back. He's not coming back. And here's Belton Jones back into the game. And he might have stepped up his game two or three notches when he got back in there. Belton averaged 13 and a half points, five assists in the two home wins. He was shooting from the free throw line, lights out 88%. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, Gabe Jackson, who holds one of the free throw uh, records here at Robert Morris, uh, is threatened by Belton. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're just talking about a guy who is just the heart and soul of this ball club. And I know we say that all the time and take nothing away from the rest of the club, but this guy just he wants to will this team to victory, doesn't it, he? It was funny when he when he got hit and was kind of stumbling as he, you know, a little bit shaken up, came out and I don't know if we turned it over on the ensuing possession or we just had a couple bad offensive possessions in a row. And I looked down the end of the bench to see, you know, if they were done with their evaluation or what was going on. And he's already standing up looking at me. Like, I didn't even need to find him. He was already standing up, and he was giving me the eye, like, okay, I'm ready, let me go back in there. So, um, you know, it's always great as a coach when, when one of your guys who is one of your leaders um, has that kind of determination and has that ability to, um, you know, pick himself up off the ground, shake himself off, and get right back in the game and make positive plays. And, uh, you know, I, I figured as soon as there was a couple – you know, not of our sharpest offensive possessions going on that he would be trying to get back in the game. And like I said, his eyes caught mine before I even really had to look too far. He was he was ready. He has a regular season free throw record now. Gabe Jackson once held that. He is threatening the all-time free throw record 
which is held by the all-time leading scorer here at Robert Morris University, and that's Myron Walker. And uh, again, just a testament to uh, how tough uh, Belton has been. Lucky Jones missed a couple of games, though. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're wondering if he's going to be able to get back into the lineup, and uh, if so, when? Uh, we're hoping as soon as possible. You know, he's, uh, he's progressed really well over the last couple days. You know, he was uh, doing different segments of practice today, and even some of them yesterday. You know, there's certain things that he's doing that, you know, give him a little bit of discomfort. So we just want to make sure that those issues subside before we, you know, let him loose because he's another guy similar in the mold of Belton Jones that once you kind of put him out on the court, he doesn't know how to go at half speed. He doesn't know how to go um, carefully. You know, he's always bumping into people. He's always involved in the action. He's always involved in physical play. So we want to make sure that his, his body will be able to take that when he does reemerge on the floor. And like I said, I, I think it, you know, there's a, there's a strong chance it could be Thursday. And if not Thursday, then I would assume definitely Saturday. Okay, I know you miss him, and uh, fortunately the team has been playing pretty well even without Lucky in the lineup. Speaking of playing pretty well, we like to highlight the guys who really uh, come on strong, particularly at the tail end of the season. I know this guy uh, was hurt in the beginning of the year. He fought off a hamstring injury, continued to play strong, uh, struggled through the middle part of the year, but Anthony Myers right now might be playing his best basketball as a colonial. Without a doubt, you know, and I think that he's a vital part to our team when he's playing aggressively on both ends of the floor offensively and defensively we're such a much better team and uh, like you said early in the year he fought off a hamstring injury there was you know some games he played terrifically and there were other games where you kind of weren't sure he was out there but you know he's been really consistent for us over the last two three weeks and he just brings a great energy to the game he, he brings a great attitude to the game he's so unselfish with the ball that I think guys love playing with him um, He's a, he's a guy that you know is always trying to do everything in his power to make his teammates and his, his team successful. And so, you know, it's nice to see him now, you know, making some more shots. He's really worked hard on his shot, you know, in the offseason. He, he got, you know, hundreds and hundreds of shots up every single day and really improved his game. And I think you see the, the results of that hard work going on right now. And, you know, if we're going to make a, a good run here in the Northeast Conference Tournament, he's going to be a huge part of that. And I think uh, he enjoys that, and I think he's excited by that. I know your best three-point shooter is Karan Williams, but when he struggles getting the ball to get down through the cylinder, Anthony Myers seems to pick things up, and then Dalton Jones comes in, he'll pop one. Russell Johnson is playing great right now, too, and he's not afraid to shoot from the outside. No, not at all. And I think, you know, Russ, he's, uh, he's again, we've talked about it for the now the last two weeks, and it's been four straight games where he's played with terrific energy. He's, he's really worked hard defensively. He's really worked hard, you know, flying around, grabbing rebounds, getting loose balls. Things that, you know, we know Russell's capable of doing, but sometimes chooses not to. And, uh, you know, him and I have long discussions about it, and uh, I think he knows it's important, but there's certain times of the year where his urgency increases, and I think as he starts to see the, the season wind down, he knows that this, this is his time to kind of increase his, his energy and intensity. And so I'm glad he's done it for four straight. We're going to need him to do it on Thursday. We're going to need him to do it, you know, here the rest of the way out. But... Um, I think he's, he's got himself in a good place as we head into this final stretch run. And we are in the final stretch run. It's Thursday, Saturday set this week. Sacred Heart uh, will be the first one up. And then, of course, uh, Quinnipiac, always a tough challenge. Actually, both of them are always tough challenges. Uh, I know that it's been a struggle playing the, the two teams on their home courts in Connecticut. But let's set it up. Let's go Sacred Heart first. How do you see the game set up? You know, Sacred Heart is, you know, they had a heartbreaking week last week I should say you know they go to LIU they lose in overtime probably had a chance should have won the game they play St. Francis New York at St. Francis New York and lose on a tip in you know so they, they had a heartbreaking week they played really really well they have you know Shane Gibson who's fourth in the country in scoring at 22 and a half points a game he's averaging 26 in the Northeast Conference he's a handful uh, and so you know he's kind of where you start to try and slow them down but they're a really difficult offensive team to slow because they they just do a great job of reading and reacting and playing off each other, sharing the basketball. Um, you know, when they came down here and played us at the Soul Center, they were without two starters, Evan Kelly and Justin Swadowski, who are two very important cogs in, in their wheel. So it's going to be a great challenge on Thursday. I think, again, it goes back to us going and playing with the defensive energy, providing that ball pressure, making people uncomfortable in order to slow them down and kind of break their rhythm offensively. I think when we've had success against Sacred Heart teams, we've been able to do that. When we haven't, they've been able to kind of play the game in their own comfort zone. And um, Thursday, it'll be a battle of that again. 
Saturday is going to be a battle too. It's an early game, 11 o'clock start at Quinnipiac, and uh, I could say this because it's easy from my side of the floor, but I love going into Quinnipiac's building. I love the atmosphere. I'm right? glad you do, Show. Um, <laughs> that makes one of us. So, you know, uh, yeah, it's going to be an early quick turnaround for us, 11 a.m. game on, on ESPNU, which is always a great treat to have our guys play on national television. Um, and uh, it, it's going to be another Robert Morris Quinnipiac game. It's going to come down probably to one or two possessions, maybe one or two loose balls, one or two rebounds. Uh, they're playing some really good basketball right now. They've kind of turned it around. You know, obviously they came down here and beat us in, in our own building and played a hell of a game and had some guys make some incredible plays down the stretch. James Johnson, as he's been for his entire four years at Quinnipiac, has been a you know a Robert Morris killer. So we're going to have to make sure that in our short window of time that we have to prepare for them, that our guys are focused and excited to go and, and play. And I think that atmosphere definitely helps with that excitement because you walk into that beautiful building and you see you know, their student body all over the place. I think uh, it, it, it kind of gets you going and gets your adrenaline pumping. I have to tell you, I, you know, in the handful of games that I've called here at Robert Morris, uh, two of my favorite ones were at Quinn Quinnipiac. Uh, the win last year in the playoffs and the win the year before that. It yeah. wasn't too shabby. No, either. those are two pretty good ones to, yeah. to, uh, to have been on the sidelines for. They truly were. Finally, Coach Toole, uh, Robert Morris has secured at least one home playoff game, and that would be uh, Thursday night, and that is March 1st mm -hmm. here at the Sewell Center, and congratulations on that. Thank you. But, uh, you know, obviously, that's a long way down the line when you consider you have two regular season home game, or two regular season road games left, and then you have to come back home, but you get a home playoff game at least. Yeah, absolutely, and it's always nice to, to have a game at least at home. Uh, it'd be nice to have two or three at home, but I'm not sure that that's the way it's going to play out. But I think, you know, we still have a lot of work to do to finish out the regular season the way that we want to and the way that will be best suited for us to go into the tournament. You know, I talked to our guys today a little bit about, you know, that Mount St. Mary's game was a, a great road win that we needed coming off a loss at Wagner. And we had a rivalry week and we needed to kind of improve some of our, get back to some of the things that we need to do to be successful. We did that and then we had, you know, Brian and Central this weekend you know, maybe another challenge that we had to rise to playing against Central, a team that had beat us already this year, coming back and bouncing back and playing the way we should. And, you know, now we go on the road and see if we can kind of up the ante again, face the next challenge that arises. And that's, you know, Sacred Heart on Thursday, who was, you know, one shot away from, from winning the game when they came down here. And then obviously Quinnipiac who beat us. So it'll just be another challenge for us to kind of finish the regular season out the way we want. And I think if we're able to, you know, be successful, it'll give us a great springboard into the conference tournament. And that's what we're looking for. All right, and we hope that it just keeps rolling and rolling and rolling. With head coach Andy Toole, I'm Chris Shublin. Don't forget, uh, we'll cover the games on the radio on WPIT Pittsburgh at 7.30 a.m. And also on rmucolonials.com. And don't forget the Quinnipiac game on ESPN3.